Pink Floyd, Wikipedia article audio. Pink Floyd were an English rock band formed in London in 1965. They achieved international acclaim with their progressive and psychedelic music. Distinguished by their use of philosophical lyrics, sonic experimentation, extended compositions, and elaborate live shows, they are one of the most commercially successful and influential groups in popular music history. History Pink Floyd were founded by students Sid Barrett on guitar and lead vocals, Nick Mason on drums, Roger Waters on bass and vocals, and Richard Wright on keyboards and vocals. They gained popularity performing in London's underground music scene during the late 1960s, and under Barrett's leadership released two charting singles and a successful debut album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Guitarist and vocalist David Gilmore joined in December 1967, Barrett left in April 1968 due to deteriorating mental health. Waters became the band's primary lyricist and conceptual leader, devising the concepts behind their albums The Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall and The Final Cut. The Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall became two of the best-selling albums of all time. Following creative tensions, Wright left Pink Floyd in 1979, followed by Waters in 1985. Gilmore and Mason continued as Pink Floyd, Wright rejoined them as a session musician and, later, band member. The three produced two more albums A Momentary Lapse of Reason and The Division Bell and toured through 1994. After nearly two decades of enmity, Gilmore, Wright, and Mason reunited with Waters in 2005 to perform as Pink Floyd in London as part of the Global Awareness event Live 8, Gilmore and Waters later stated they had no further plans to reunite the band. Barrett died in 2006, and Wright in 2008. The final Pink Floyd studio album, The Endless River, was recorded without Waters and based almost entirely on unreleased material. 1963-1967, Early Years Pink Floyd were inducted into the American Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996 and the UK Music Hall of Fame in 2005. By 2013, the band had sold more than 250 million records worldwide. Formation Roger Waters and Nick Mason met while studying architecture at the London Polytechnic at Regent Street. They first played music together in a group formed by Keith Noble and Clive Metcalf with Noble's sister Shellac. Richard Wright, a fellow architecture student, joined later that year, and the group became a sextet, Sigma Six. Waters played lead guitar, Mason drums, and Wright rhythm guitar. The band performed at private functions and rehearsed in a tea room in the basement of the Regent Street Polytechnic. They performed songs by the searchers and material written by their manager and songwriter, fellow student Ken Chapman. Signing with Emmy In September 1963, Waters and Mason moved into a flat at 39, Stanhope Gardens near Crouch and Indiana, London owned by Mike Leonard, a part-time tutor at the nearby Hornsey College of Art and the Regent Street Polytechnic. Mason moved out after the 1964 academic year, and guitarist Bob Close moved in during September 1964, prompting Waters' switch to bass. Sigma Six went through several names, including the Megadiaths, the Abdabs, and the Screaming Abdabs, Leonard's Lodgers, and the Spectrum 5, before settling on the T set. In 1964, as Metcalf and Noble left to form their own band, guitarist Sid Barrett joined Close and Waters at Stanhope Gardens. 
Barrett, two years younger, had moved to London in 1962 to study at the Camberwell College of Arts. Waters and Barrett were childhood friends, Waters had often visited Barrett and watched him play guitar at Barrett's mother's house. Mason said about Barrett, in a period when everyone was being cool in a very adolescent, self-conscious way, Sid was unfashionably outgoing. My enduring memory of our first encounter is the fact that he bothered to come up and introduce himself to me. The Piper at the Gates of Dawn Noble and Metcalf left the tea set in late 1963, and Close introduced the band to singer Chris Dennis, a technician with the Royal Air Force. In December 1964, they secured their first recording time, at a studio in West Hampstead, through one of Wright's friends, who let them use some downtime free. Wright, who was taking a break from his studies, did not participate in the session. When the RAF assigned Dennis a post in Bahrain in early 1965, Barrett became the band's frontman. Later that year, they became the resident band at the Countdown Club near Kensington High Street in London, where from late night until early morning they played three sets of 90 minutes each. During this period, Spurred by the group's need to extend their sets to minimize song repetition, the band realized that songs could be extended with lengthy solos, wrote Mason. After pressure from his parents and advice from his college tutors, Close quit the band in mid-1965 and Barrett took over lead guitar. The group first referred to themselves as the Pink Floyd Sound in late 1965. Barrett created the name on the spur of the moment when he discovered that another band, also called the T-Set, were to perform at one of their gigs. The name is derived from the given names of two blues musicians whose Piedmont blues records Barrett had in his collection, Pink Anderson and Floyd Council. 1967-1978, Transition and International Success by 1966, the group's repertoire consisted mainly of rhythm and blues songs and they had begun to receive paid bookings, including a performance at the Marquee Club in March 1966, where Peter Jenner, a lecturer at the London School of Economics, noticed them. Jenner was impressed by the sonic effects Barrett and Wright created, and with his business partner and friend Andrew King became their manager. The pair had little experience in the music industry and used King's inheritance to set up Black Hill Enterprises, purchasing about £1,000 worth of new instruments and equipment for the band. It was around this time that Jenner suggested they drop the sound part of their band name, thus becoming the Pink Floyd. Under Jenner and King's guidance, the group became part of London's underground music scene, playing at venues including All Saints Hall and the Marquee. While performing at the Countdown Club, the band had experimented with long instrumental excursions, and they began to expand them with rudimentary but effective light shows, projected by coloured slides and domestic lights. Jenner and King's social connections helped gain the band prominent coverage in the Financial Times and an article in the Sunday Times which stated, at the launching of the new magazine IT the other night a pop group called the Pink Floyd played throbbing music while a series of bizarre coloured shapes flashed on a huge screen behind them, apparently very psychedelic. In 1966, the band strengthened their business relationship with Black Hill Enterprises, becoming equal partners with Jenner and King and the band members each holding a one-sixth share. By late 1966, their set included fewer R&B standards and more Barrett originals, many of which would be included on their first album. While they had significantly increased the frequency of their performances, the band were still not widely accepted. 
Following a performance at a Catholic youth club, the owner refused to pay them, claiming that their performance was not music. When their management filed suit in a small claims court against the owner of the youth organization, a local magistrate upheld the owner's decision. The band was much better received at the UFO club in London, where they began to build a fan base. Barrett's performances were enthusiastic, leaping around, madness, improvisation, to get past his limitations and into areas that were, very interesting. Which none of the others could do, wrote biographer Nicholas Schaffner. Replacement of Barrett by Gilmore A Saucer Full of Secrets Amagama, Adam Hart Mother, and Metal The Dark Side of the Moon In 1967, Pink Floyd began to attract the attention of the music industry. While in negotiations with record companies, IT co-founder and UFO club manager Joe Boyd and Pink Floyd's booking agent Brian Morrison arranged and funded a recording session at Sound Techniques in West Hampstead. Three days later, Pink Floyd signed with Emmy, receiving a £5,000 advance. Emmy released the band's first single, Arnold Lane with the B-side Candy and a Current Bun, on March 10, 1967 on its Columbia label. Both tracks were recorded on January 29, 1967. Arnold Lane's references to cross-dressing led to a ban by several radio stations, however, creative manipulation by the retailers who supplied sales figures to the music business meant that the single peaked in the UK at number 20. Emmy Columbia released Pink Floyd's second single, See Emily Play, on June 16, 1967. It fared slightly better than Arnold Lane, peaking at number 6 in the UK. The band performed on the BBC's Look of the Week, where Waters and Barrett, erudite and engaging, faced tough questioning from Hans Keller. They appeared on the BBC's Top of the Pops, a popular program that controversially required artists to mime their singing and playing. Though Pink Floyd returned for two more performances, by the third, Barrett had begun to unravel and it was around this time that the band first noticed significant changes in his behavior. By early 1967, he was regularly using LSD, and Mason described him as completely distanced from everything going on. Morrison and Emmy producer Norman Smith negotiated Pink Floyd's first recording contract, and as part of the deal, the band agreed to record their first album at Emmy Studios in London. Mason recalled that the sessions were trouble-free. Smith disagreed, stating that Barrett was unresponsive to his suggestions and constructive criticism. Emmy Columbia released The Piper at the Gates of Dawn in August 1967. The album peaked at number six, spending 14 weeks on the UK charts. One month later, it was released under the Tower Records label. Pink Floyd continued to draw large crowds at the UFO club, however, Barrett's mental breakdown was by then causing serious concern. The group initially hoped that his erratic behavior would be a passing phase, but some were less optimistic, including Jenner and his assistant, June Child, who commented, I found in the dressing room and he was so, gone. Roger Waters and I got him on his feet, we got him out to the stage. The band started to play and Sid just stood there. He had his guitar around his neck and his arms just hanging down. Forced to cancel Pink Floyd's appearance at the prestigious National Jazz and Blues Festival, as well as several other shows, King informed the music press that Barrett was suffering from nervous exhaustion. Waters arranged a meeting with psychiatrist R.D. Latting, 
and though Waters personally drove Barrett to the appointment, Barrett refused to come out of the car. A stay in Formentera with Sam Hutt, a doctor well established in the underground music scene, led to no visible improvement. The band followed a few concert dates in Europe during September with their first tour of the U.S. in October. As the U.S. tour went on, Barrett's condition grew steadily worse. During appearances on the Dick Clark and Pat Boone shows in November, Barrett confounded his hosts by not responding to questions and staring off into space. He refused to move his lips when it came time to mime see Emily play on Boone's show. After these embarrassing episodes, King ended their U.S. visit and immediately sent them home to London. Soon after their return, they supported Jimi Hendrix during a tour of England, however, Barrett's depression worsened as the tour continued, reaching a crisis point in December, when the band responded by adding a new member to their lineup. In December 1967, the group added guitarist David Gilmour as the fifth member of Pink Floyd. Gilmour already knew Barrett, having studied with him at Cambridge Tech in the early 1960s. The two had performed at lunchtimes together with guitars and harmonicas, and later hitchhiked and busked their way around the south of France. In 1965, while a member of Joker's Wild, Gilmore had watched the tea set. Morrison's assistant, Steve O'Rourke, set Gilmore up in a room at O'Rourke's house with a salary of £30 per week and in January 1968, Black Hill Enterprises announced Gilmore as the band's newest member, the second guitarist and its fifth member, the band intending to continue with Barrett as a non-performing songwriter. Jenner commented, the idea was that Dave would, cover for eccentricities and when that got to be not workable, Sid was just going to write. Just to try to keep him involved. In an expression of his frustration, Barrett, who was expected to write additional hit singles to follow up Arnold Lane and see Emily play, instead introduced Have You Got It Yet? to the band, intentionally changing the structure on each performance so as to make the song impossible to follow and learn. In a January 1968 photo shoot of the five-man Pink Floyd, the photographs show Barrett looking detached from the others, staring into the distance. Working with Barrett eventually proved too difficult, and matters came to a conclusion in January while en route to a performance in Southampton when a band member asked if they should collect Barrett. According to Gilmore, the answer was nah, let's not bother, signaling the end of Barrett's tenure with Pink Floyd. Waters later admitted, he was our friend, but most of the time we now wanted to strangle him. In early March 1968, Pink Floyd met with business partners Jenner and King to discuss the band's future, Barrett agreed to leave. Jenner and King believed Barrett to be the creative genius of the band, and decided to represent him and end their relationship with Pink Floyd. Morrison then sold his business to NEMS Enterprises, and O'Rourke became the band's personal manager. Black Hill announced Barrett's departure on April 6, 1968. After Barrett's departure, the burden of lyrical composition and creative direction fell mostly on Waters. Initially, Gilmore mimed to Barrett's voice on the group's European TV appearances. However, while playing on the university circuit, they avoided Barrett's songs in favor of Waters and write material such as It Would Be So Nice and Careful With That Axe, Eugene. In 1968, Pink Floyd returned to Abbey Road Studios to record their second album, A Saucerful of Secrets. The album included Barrett's final contribution to their discography, Juke Band Blues. 
Waters began to develop his own songwriter, contributing set the controls for the heart of the sun, let there be more light and corporal clegg. Wright composed Seesaw and Remember a Day. Norman Smith encouraged them to self-produce their music, and they recorded demos of new material at their houses. With Smith's instruction at Abbey Road, they learned how to use the recording studio to realize their artistic vision. However, Smith remained unconvinced by their music, and when Mason struggled to perform his drum part on Remember a Day, Smith stepped in as his replacement. Wright recalled Smith's attitude about the sessions, Norman gave up on the second album, he was forever saying things like, you can't do 20 minutes of this ridiculous noise. As neither Waters nor Mason could read music, to illustrate the structure of the album's title track, they invented their own system of notation. Gilmore later described their method as looking like an architectural diagram. Released in June 1968, the album featured a psychedelic cover designed by Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell of Hypnosis. The first of several Pink Floyd album covers designed by Hypnosis, it was the second time that Emmy permitted one of their groups to contract designers for an album jacket. The release peaked at number 9, spending 11 weeks on the UK chart. Record Mirror gave the album an overall favorable review, but urged listeners to forget it as background music to a party. John Peel described a live performance of the title track as like a religious experience, while NME described the song as long and boring, little to warrant its monotonous direction. On the day after the album's UK release, Pink Floyd performed at the first ever free concert in Hyde Park. In July 1968, they returned to the US for a second visit. Accompanied by The Soft Machine and The Who, it marked Pink Floyd's first significant tour. In December of that year, they released Point Me at the Sky, no more successful than the two singles they had released since See Emily Play, it would be the band's last until their 1973 release, Money. The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, A Saucer Full of Secrets, More, Umegumma, Adam Hart Mother, Metal, Obscured by Clouds, The Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, The Final Cut, A Momentary Lapse of Reason, The Division Bell, The Endless River. Umagumma represented a departure from their previous work. Released as a double LP on Emmy's Harvest label, the first two sides contained live performances recorded at Manchester College of Commerce and Mothers, a club in Birmingham. The second LP contained a single experimental contribution from each band member. Umagum received positive reviews upon its release, in November 1969. The album peaked at number 5, spending 21 weeks on the UK chart. In October 1970, Pink Floyd released Adam Hart Mother. An early version premiered in France in January, but disagreements over the mix prompted the hiring of Ron Jeson to work out the sound issues. Jeson worked to improve the score, but with little creative input from the band, production was troublesome. Jeson eventually completed the project with the aid of John Aldis, who was the director of the choir hired to perform on the record. Smith earned an executive producer credit, and the album marked his final official contribution to the band's discography. Gilmore said it was a neat way of saying that he didn't do anything. Waters was critical of Adam Hart Mother, claiming that he would prefer if it were thrown into the dustbin and never listened to by anyone ever again. Gilmore was equally dismissive of the album and once described it as a load of rubbish, stating, I think we were scraping the barrel a bit at that period. 
Pink Floyd's first number one album, Adam Hart Mother was hugely successful in Britain, spending 18 weeks on the UK chart. It premiered at the Bath Festival on June 27, 1970. Pink Floyd toured extensively across America and Europe in 1970. In 1971, Pink Floyd took second place in a reader's poll, in Melody Maker, and for the first time were making a profit. Mason and Wright became fathers and bought homes in London while Gilmore, still single, moved to a 19th century farm in Essex. Waters installed a home recording studio at his house in Islington in a converted tool shed at the back of his garden. In January 1971, upon their return from touring Adam Hart Mother, Pink Floyd began working on new material. Lacking a central theme, they attempted several unproductive experiments, Engineer John Leckie described the sessions as often beginning in the afternoon and ending early the next morning, during which time nothing would get. There was no record company contact whatsoever, except when their label manager would show up now and again with a couple of bottles of wine and a couple of joints. The band spent long periods working on basic sounds, or a guitar riff. They also spent several days at Air Studios, attempting to create music using a variety of household objects, a project which would be revisited between The Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here. Released in October 1971, Metal not only confirms lead guitarist David Gilmore's emergence as a real shaping force with the group, it states forcefully and accurately that the group is well into the growth track again, wrote Jean Charles Costa of Rolling Stone. NME called Metal an exceptionally good album, singling out Echoes as the zenith which the Floyd have been striving for. However, Melody Maker's Michael Watts found it underwhelming, calling the album a soundtrack to a non existent movie and shrugging off Pink Floyd as so much sound and fury, signifying nothing. Metal is a transitional album between the Barrett-influenced group of the late 1960s and the emerging Pink Floyd. The LP peaked at number 3, spending 82 weeks on the UK chart. Pink Floyd recorded The Dark Side of the Moon between May 1972 and January 1973 with Emmy staff engineer Alan Parsons at Abbey Road. The title is an allusion to lunacy rather than astronomy. The band had composed and refined the material on Dark Side while touring the UK, Japan, North America, and Europe. Producer Chris Thomas assisted Parsons. Hypnosis designed the album's packaging which included George Hardy's iconic refracting prism design on the cover. Thorgerson's Dark Side album cover features a beam of white light, representing unity, passing through a prism, which represents society. The resulting refracted beam of colored light symbolizes unity diffracted, leaving an absence of unity. Waters is the sole author of the album's lyrics. Released in March 1973, the LP became an instant chart success in the UK and throughout Western Europe, earning an enthusiastic response from critics. Each member of Pink Floyd except Wright boycotted the press release of The Dark Side of the Moon because a quadraphonic mix had not yet been completed, and they felt presenting the album through a poor quality stereo PAW system was insufficient. Melody maker S. Roy Hollingworth described Side 1 as utterly confused, difficult to follow, but praised Side 2, writing, The songs, the sounds, the rhythms were solid, saxophone hit the air, the band rocked and rolled. Rolling Stone S. Lloyd Grossman described it as a fine album with a textural and conceptual richness that not only invites, but demands involvement. Throughout March 1973, 
The Dark Side of the Moon featured as part of Pink Floyd's U.S. tour. The album is one of the most commercially successful rock albums of all time, a U.S. number one, it remained on the Billboard chart for more than 14 years, selling more than 45 million copies worldwide. In Britain, the album peaked at number two, spending 364 weeks on the UK chart. Dark Side is the world's third best-selling album, and the 21st best-selling album of all time in the US. The success of the album brought enormous wealth to the members of Pink Floyd. Waters and Wright bought large country houses while Mason became a collector of expensive cars. Disenchanted with their U.S. record company, Capitol Records, Pink Floyd and O'Rourke negotiated a new contract with Columbia Records, who gave them a reported advance of $1 million. In Europe, they continued to be represented by Harvest Records. After a tour of the UK performing Dark Side, Pink Floyd returned to the studio in January 1975 and began work on their ninth studio album, Wish You Were Here. Parsons declined an offer to continue working with them, becoming successful in his own right with the Alan Parsons Project, and so the band turned to Brian Humphreys. Initially, they found it difficult to compose new material, the success of the dark side of the moon had left Pink Floyd physically and emotionally drained. Wright later described these early sessions as falling within a difficult period and Waters found them tortuous. Gilmore was more interested in improving the band's existing material. Mason's failing marriage left him in a general malaise and with a sense of apathy, both of which interfered with his drumming. Despite the lack of creative direction, Waters began to visualize a new concept after several weeks. During 1974, Pink Floyd had sketched out three original compositions and had performed them at a series of concerts in Europe. These compositions became the starting point for a new album whose opening four-note guitar phrase, composed purely by chance by Gilmore, reminded Waters of Barrett. The songs provided a fitting summary of the rise and fall of their former bandmate. Waters commented, Because I wanted to get as close as possible to what I felt, indefinable, inevitable melancholy about the disappearance of Sid. While Pink Floyd were working on the album, Barrett made an impromptu visit to the studio during which Thor Gerson recalled that he sat round and talked for a bit, but he wasn't really there. He had changed significantly in appearance, so much so that the band did not initially recognize him. Waters was reportedly deeply upset by the experience. Most of Wish You Were Here premiered on July 5, 1975, at an open-air music festival at Nebworth. Released in September, it reached number one in both the UK and the US. In 1975, Pink Floyd bought a three-story group of church halls at 35, Britannia Row in Islington and began converting the building into a recording studio and storage space. In 1976, they recorded their tenth album, Animals, in their newly finished 24-track studio. The concept of animals originated with Waters, loosely based on George Orwell's political fable, Animal Farm. The album's lyrics described different classes of society as dogs, pigs, and sheep. Hypnosis received credit for the packaging of animals, however, Waters designed the final concept, choosing an image of the aging Battersea power station, over which they superimposed an image of a pig. The division of royalties was a source of conflict between band members, who earned royalties on a persong basis. Although Gilmore was largely responsible for dogs, which took up almost the entire first side of the album, he received less than Waters 
who contributed the much shorter two-part Pigs on the Wing. Wright commented, It was partly my fault because I didn't push my material, but Dave did have something to offer, and only managed to get a couple of things on there. Mason recalled, Roger was in full flow with the ideas, but he was really keeping Dave down, and frustrating him deliberately. Gilmore, distracted by the birth of his first child, contributed little else toward the album. Similarly, neither Mason nor Wright contributed much toward animals, Wright had marital problems, and his relationship with Waters was also suffering. Animals is the first Pink Floyd album that does not include a writing credit for Wright, who commented, Animals, wasn't a fun record to make, this was when Roger really started to believe that he was the sole writer for the band, that it was only because of him that we're still going, when he started to develop his ego trips, the person he would have his conflicts with would be me. Released in January 1977, the album peaked on the UK chart at number 2, and the US chart at number 3. NME described the album as one of the most extreme, relentless, harrowing, and downright iconoclastic hunks of music, and melody maker S. Carl Dallas called it uncomfortable taste of reality in a medium that has become in recent years, increasingly so perific. Wish You Were Here Pink Floyd performed much of the album's material during their In the Flesh tour. It was the band's first experience playing large stadiums, whose size caused unease in the band. Waters began arriving at each venue alone, departing immediately after the performance. On one occasion, Wright flew back to England, threatening to leave the band. At the Montreal Olympic Stadium, a group of noisy and enthusiastic fans in the front row of the audience irritated Waters so much that he spat at one of them. The end of the tour marked a low point for Gilmore, who felt that the band achieved the success they had sought, with nothing left for them to accomplish. In July 1978, amid a financial crisis caused by negligent investments, Waters presented the group with two original ideas for their next album. The first was a 90-minute demo with the working title Bricks in the Wall, and the other would later become Waters' first solo album, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Although both Mason and Gilmore were initially cautious, they chose the former to be their next album. Bob Ezrin CO produced and he wrote a 40-page script for the new album. Ezrin based the story on the central figure of Pink a gestalt character inspired by Waters' childhood experiences, the most notable of which was the death of his father in World War II. This first metaphorical brick led to more problems, Pink would become drug-addled and depressed by the music industry, eventually transforming into a megalomaniac a development inspired partly by the decline of Sid Barrett. At the end of the album, the increasingly fascist audience would watch as Pink tore down the wall, once again becoming a regular and caring person. During the recording of The Wall, Waters, Gilmore, and Mason became increasingly dissatisfied with Wright's lack of contribution to the album. Gilmore said that Wright hadn't contributed anything of any value whatsoever to the album he did very, very little and this was why he got the boot. According to Mason, Rick's contribution was to turn up and sit in on the sessions without doing anything, just being a producer. Waters commented, was not prepared to cooperate in making the record, it was agreed by everybody either can have a long battle or can agree to, finish making the album, keep full share, but at the end of it leave quietly. Rick agreed. The album was supported by another brick in the wall, Pink Floyd's first single since Money, which topped the charts in the US and the UK. 
Released on November 30, 1979, The Wall topped the Billboard chart in the US for 15 weeks, reaching number 3 in the UK. The Wall ranks number 3 on the RIAAS list of the all-time top 100 albums, with 23 million certified units sold in the US. The cover is one of their most minimalist designs, with a stark white brick wall, and no trademark or band name. It was also their first album cover since The Piper at the Gates of Dawn not designed by Hypnosis. Gerald Scarf produced a series of animations for the subsequent live shows, The Wall Tour. He also commissioned the construction of large inflatable puppets representing characters from the storyline including the mother, the ex-wife and the schoolmaster. Pink Floyd used the puppets during their performances of the album. Relationships within the band were at an all-time low, therefore Winnebago's parked in a circle, the doors facing away from the center. Waters used his own vehicle to arrive at the venue and stayed in different hotels from the rest of the band. Wright returned as a paid musician and was the only one of the four to profit from the venture which lost about $600,000. The Wall concept also spawned a film, the original idea for which was to be a combination of live concert footage and animated scenes. However, the concert footage proved impractical to film. Alan Parker agreed to direct and took a different approach. The animated sequences would remain but scenes would be acted by professional actors with no dialogue. Waters was screen-tested, but quickly discarded and they asked Bob Geldof to accept the role of Pink. Geldof was initially dismissive, condemning the Wall-S storyline as bollocks. Eventually won over by the prospect of participation in a significant film and receiving a large payment for his work, Geldof agreed. Screened at the Cannes Film Festival in May 1982, Pink Floyd The Wall premiered in the UK in July 1982. In 1982, Waters suggested a new musical project with the working title Spare Bricks, originally conceived as the soundtrack album for Pink Floyd The Wall. With the onset of the Falklands War, Waters changed direction and began writing new material. He saw Margaret Thatcher's response to the invasion of the Falklands as jingoistic and unnecessary, and dedicated the album to his late father. Immediately arguments arose between Waters and Gilmore, who felt that the album should include all new material, rather than recycle songs passed over for the wall. Waters felt that Gilmore had contributed little to the band's lyrical repertoire. Michael Kamen, a contributor to the orchestral arrangements of The Wall, mediated between the two, also performing the role traditionally occupied by the then absent Wright. The tension within the band grew. Waters and Gilmore worked independently, however, Gilmore began to feel the strain, sometimes barely maintaining his composure. After a final confrontation, Gilmore's name disappeared from the credit list, reflecting what Waters felt was his lack of songwriter contributions. Animals Though Mason's musical contributions were minimal, he stayed busy recording sound effects for an experimental holophonic system to be used on the album. With marital problems of his own, he remained a distant figure. Pink Floyd did not use Thor Gerson for the cover design, Waters choosing to design the cover himself. Released in March 1983, the final cut went straight to number one in the UK and number six in the US. Waters wrote all the lyrics, as well as all the music on the album. Gilmore did not have any material ready for the album and asked Waters to delay the recording until he could write some songs, but Waters refused. Gilmore later commented, I'm certainly guilty at times of being lazy, 
but he wasn't right about wanting to put some duff tracks on the final cut. Rolling Stone magazine gave the album five stars, with Kurt Loder calling it a superlative achievement, art rock's crowning masterpiece. Loder viewed the final cut as essentially a Roger Waters solo album. 1978-1985, Waters Lead Era The Wall The Final Cut A Spent Force, Waters' Departure and Legal Battles 1985-1994, Gilmore Lead Era Gilmore had recorded his second solo album, About Face, in 1984, and he used it to express his feelings about a variety of topics, from the murder of John Lennon to his relationship with Waters. He later stated that he used the album to distance himself from Pink Floyd. Soon afterwards, Waters began touring his first solo album, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Wright formed Z with Dave Harris and recorded Identity, which went almost unnoticed upon its release. Mason released his second solo album, Profiles, in August 1985. A Momentary Lapse of Reason Following the release of the pros and cons of Hitchhiking, Waters publicly insisted that Pink Floyd would not reunite. He contacted O'Rourke to discuss settling future royalty payments. O'Rourke felt obliged to inform Mason and Gilmore, which angered Waters, who wanted to dismiss him as the band's manager. He terminated his management contract with O'Rourke and employed Peter Rudge to manage his affairs. Waters wrote to Emmy and Columbia announcing he had left the band, and asked them to release him from his contractual obligations. Gilmore believed that Waters left to hasten the demise of Pink Floyd. Waters later stated that, by not making new albums, Pink Floyd would be in breach of contract which would suggest that royalty payments would be suspended and that the other band members had forced him from the group by threatening to sue him. He then went to the High Court in an effort to dissolve the band and prevent the use of the Pink Floyd name, declaring Pink Floyd a spent force creatively. When his lawyers discovered that the partnership had never been formally confirmed, Waters returned to the High Court in an attempt to obtain a veto over further use of the band's name. Gilmore responded by issuing a carefully worded press release affirming that Pink Floyd would continue to exist. He later told the Sunday Times, Roger is a dog in the manger and I'm going to fight him. In 2013, Waters stated that he regretted the lawsuit, saying, I was wrong. Of course I was. In 1986, Gilmore began recruiting musicians for what would become Pink Floyd's first album without Waters, A Momentary Lapse of Reason. There were legal obstacles to Wright's readmittance to the band, but after a meeting in Hampstead, Pink Floyd invited Wright to participate in the coming sessions. Gilmore later stated that Wright's presence would make us stronger legally and musically, and Pink Floyd employed him as a musician with weekly earnings of $11,000. Recording sessions for the album began on Gilmore's houseboat, the Astoria, moored along the River Thames. Gilmore worked with several songwriters, including Eric Stewart and Roger McGuff, eventually choosing Anthony Moore to write the album's lyrics. Gilmore would later admit that the project was difficult without Waters' creative direction. Mason, concerned that he was too out of practice to perform on the album, made use of session musicians to complete many of the drum parts. He instead busied himself with the album's sound effects. The Division Bell a Momentary Lapse of Reason was released in September 1987. Storm Thor Gerson, whose creative input was absent from the wall and the final cut, designed the album cover. 
To drive home the point that Waters had left the band, they included a group photograph on the inside cover, the first since metal. The album went straight to number three in the UK and the US. Waters commented, I think it's facile, but a quite clever forgery. The songs are poor in general. Gilmore's lyrics are third rate. Although Gilmore initially viewed the album as a return to the band's top form, Wright disagreed, stating, Roger's criticisms are fair. It's not a band album at all. Q magazine described the album as essentially a Gilmore solo effort. Waters attempted to subvert the momentary lapse of reason tour by contacting promoters in the US and threatening to sue them if they used the Pink Floyd name. Gilmore and Mason funded the startup costs with Mason using his Ferrari 250 GTO as collateral. Early rehearsals for the upcoming tour were chaotic, with Mason and Wright entirely out of practice. Realizing he had taken on too much work, Gilmore asked Bob Ezrin to assist them. As Pink Floyd toured throughout North America, Waters Radio KAOS tour was on occasion, close by, though in much smaller venues than those hosting his former band's performances. Waters issued a writ for copyright fees for the band's use of the Flying Pig. Pink Floyd responded by attaching a large set of male genitalia to its underside to distinguish it from Waters' design. The parties reached a legal agreement on 23 December, Mason and Gilmore retained the right to use the Pink Floyd name in perpetuity and Waters received exclusive rights to, among other things, The Wall. 2005-2014 Reunion, Deaths, and Final Album For several years Pink Floyd had busied themselves with personal pursuits, such as filming and competing in the La Carrera Panamericana and recording a soundtrack for a film based on the event. In January 1993, they began working on a new album, returning to Britannia Row Studios where for several days, Gilmore, Mason, and Wright worked collaboratively, improvising material. After about two weeks, the band had enough ideas to begin creating songs. Ezrin returned to CO produce the album and production moved to the Astoria, where from February to May 1993, they worked on about 25 ideas. Contractually, Wright was not a member of the band, and said it came close to a point where I wasn't going to do the album. However, he earned five CO writing credits on the album, his first on a Pink Floyd album since 1975's Wish You Were Here. Another songwriter credited on the album was Gilmore's future wife, Polly Sampson. She helped him write several tracks, including High Hopes, a collaborative arrangement which, though initially tense, pulled the whole album together, according to Ezrin. They hired Michael Kamen to arrange the album's orchestral parts, Dick Perry and Chris Thomas also returned. Writer Douglas Adams provided the album title and Thor Gerson the cover artwork. Thor Gerson drew inspiration for the album cover from the Moai monoliths of Easter Island, two opposing faces forming an implied third face about which he commented, the absent face the ghost of Pink Floyd's past, Sid and Roger. Eager to avoid competing against other album releases, as had happened with a momentary lapse, Pink Floyd set a deadline of April 1994 at which point they would resume touring. The album reached number one in both the UK and the US. It spent 51 weeks on the UK chart. Live 8 Reunion Pink Floyd spent more than two weeks rehearsing in a hangar at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California, before opening on March 29, 1994, in Miami 
with an almost identical road crew to that used for their momentary lapse of reason tour. They played a variety of Pink Floyd favorites, and later changed their set list to include the dark side of the moon in its entirety. The tour, Pink Floyd's last, ended on October 29, 1994. On July 2, 2005, Waters, Gilmore, Mason and Wright performed together as Pink Floyd for the first time in more than 24 years, at the Live 8 concert in London's Hyde Park. Organizer Bob Geldof arranged the reunion, having called Mason earlier in the year to explore the possibility of their reuniting for the event. Geldof asked Gilmore, who turned down the offer, and then asked Mason to intercede on his behalf. Mason declined, but contacted Waters who was immediately enthusiastic. Waters then called Geldof to discuss the event, scheduled to take place in one month. About two weeks later Waters called Gilmore, their first conversation in two years, and the next day the latter agreed. Gilmore then contacted Wright who immediately agreed. In their statement to the press, they stressed the unimportance of the band's problems in the context of the Live Aid event. Deaths of Barrett and Wright They planned their set list at the Connaught Hotel in London, followed by three days of rehearsals at Black Island Studios. The sessions were problematic, with minor disagreements over the style and pace of the songs they were practicing, the running order decided on the eve of the event. At the beginning of their performance of Wish You Were Here, Waters told the audience, quite emotional, standing up here with these three guys after all these years, standing to be counted with the rest of you, we're doing this for everyone who's not here, and particularly of course for Sid. At the end, Gilmore thanked the audience and started to walk off the stage. Waters then called him back and the band shared a group hug. Images of that hug were a favorite among Sunday newspapers after Live 8. Waters commented on their almost 20 years of animosity, I don't think any of us came out of the years from 1985 with any credit. It was a bad, negative time, and I regret my part in that negativity. Though Pink Floyd turned down a contract worth £136 million for a final tour, Waters did not rule out more performances, suggesting it ought to be for a charity event only. However, Gilmore told the Associated Press that a reunion would not happen, stating, The rehearsals convinced me it wasn't something I wanted to be doing a lot of. There have been all sorts of farewell moments in people's lives and careers which they have then rescinded, but I think I can fairly categorically say that there won't be a tour or an album again that I take part in. It isn't to do with animosity or anything like that. It's just... I've been there, I've done it. In February 2006, Gilmore was interviewed by Gino Castaldo from the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, the resulting article declared, Patience for fans in mourning. The news is official. Pink Floyd the brand is dissolved, finished, definitely deceased. Asked about the future of Pink Floyd, Gilmore responded, It's over. I've had enough. I'm 60 years old it is much more comfortable to work on my own. Gilmore and Waters repeatedly said that they had no plans to reunite with the surviving former members. Further Performances and Re-Releases Barrett died on July 7, 2006, at his home in Cambridge, aged 60. His family interred him at Cambridge Crematorium on July 18, 2006, no Pink Floyd members attended. After Barrett's death, Wright commented, 
the band are very naturally upset and sad to hear of Sid Barrett's death. Sid was the guiding light of the early band lineup and leaves a legacy which continues to inspire. Although Barrett had faded into obscurity over the previous 35 years, the national press praised him for his contributions to music. On May 10, 2007, Waters, Gilmore, Wright and Mason performed during the Barrett tribute concert Madcap's Last Laugh at the Barbican Centre in London. Gilmore, Wright and Mason performed the Barrett compositions, Bike and Arnold Lane, and Waters performed a solo version of his song Flickering Flame. Wright died of an undisclosed form of cancer on September 15, 2008, aged 65. His former bandmates paid tributes to his life and work, Gilmore said in the welter of arguments about who or what was Pink Floyd, Rick's enormous input was frequently forgotten. He was gentle, unassuming, and private but his soulful voice and playing were vital, magical components of our most recognized Pink Floyd sound. A week after Wright's death, Gilmore performed Remember a Day from a Saucerful of Secrets, written and originally sung by Wright, in tribute to him. Keyboardist Keith Emerson released a statement praising Wright as the backbone of Pink Floyd. On July 10, 2010, Waters and Gilmore performed together at a charity event for the Hoping Foundation. The event, which raised money for Palestinian children, took place at Kiddington Hall in Oxfordshire, England, with an audience of approximately 200. In return for Waters' appearance at the event, Gilmore performed comfortably numb at Waters' performance of The Wall at the London O2 Arena on May 12, 2011, singing the choruses and playing the two guitar solos. Mason also joined, playing tambourine four outside the wall with Gilmore on mandolin. The Endless River On September 26, 2011, Pink Floyd and Emmy launched an exhaustive re-release campaign under the title Why Pink Floyd, reissuing the band's back catalogue in newly remastered versions, including experience and immersion multi-disc multi-format editions. The albums were remastered by James Guthrie, CO producer of The Wall. In November 2015, Pink Floyd released a limited edition EP, 1965, their first recordings, comprising six songs recorded prior to the Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Musicianship In 2012, Gilmore and Mason decided to revisit recordings made with Wright, mainly during the Division Bell sessions, to create a new Pink Floyd album. They recruited session musicians to help record new parts and generally harness studio technology. Waters was not involved. Mason described the album as a tribute to Wright, I think this record is a good way of recognizing a lot of what he does and how his playing was at the heart of the Pink Floyd sound. Listening back to the sessions, it really brought home to me what a special player he was. Sampson announced The Endless River in July 2014 on Twitter. DA Tales were announced on Pink Floyd's website on July 7, describing it as comprising mainly ambient and instrumental music. It was released November 7, 2014, the second Pink Floyd album distributed by Parlo Phone following the release of the 20th anniversary editions of The Division Bell earlier in 2014. Though The Endless River received mixed reviews, it became the most pre-ordered album of all time on Amazon UK, and debuted at number one in several countries. The vinyl edition was the fastest-selling UK vinyl release of 2014 and the fastest-selling since 1997. Genres
Gilmore stated that The Endless River is Pink Floyd's last album, saying, I think we have successfully commandeered the best of what there is. It's a shame, but this is the end. There was no tour to support the album, as Gilmore felt it was kind of impossible without Wright. In August 2015, Gilmore reiterated that Pink Floyd were done and that to reunite without Wright would just be wrong. In July 2016, the band announced a forthcoming box set, The Early Years 1965-1972, containing 27 discs comprising CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays of outtakes, live recordings, new mixes and feature films. Considered one of the UK's first psychedelic music groups, Pink Floyd began their career at the vanguard of London's underground music scene. Some categorize their work from that era as space rock. According to Rolling Stone, by 1967, they had developed an unmistakably psychedelic sound, performing long, loud sweet-like compositions that touched on hard rock, blues, country, folk, and electronic music. Released in 1968, the song Careful With That Axe, Eugene helped galvanize their reputation as an art rock group. Other genres attributed to the band are experimental rock, acid rock, proto-prog, experimental pop, and psychedelic pop. By the late 1960s, the press had begun to label their music progressive rock. O'Neill Serber comments on the music of Pink Floyd. Rarely will you find Floyd dishing up catchy hooks, tunes short enough for airplay, or predictable three-chord blues progressions, and never will you find them spending much time on the usual pop album of romance, partying, or self-hype. Their sonic universe is expansive, intense, and challenging. Where most other bands neatly fit the songs to the music, the two forming a sort of autonomous and seamless whole complete with memorable hooks, Pink Floyd tends to set lyrics within a broader soundscape that often seems to have a life of its own. Pink Floyd employs extended, Stand-alone instrumentals which are never mere vehicles for showing off virtuoso but are planned and integral parts of the performance. In 1968, Wright commented on Pink Floyd's sonic reputation, It's hard to see why we were cast as the first British psychedelic group. We never saw ourselves that way, we realized that we were, after all, only playing for fun tied to no particular form of music, we could do whatever we wanted, the emphasis, firmly on spontaneity and improvisation. Waters gave a less enthusiastic assessment of the band's early sound, there wasn't anything grand about it. We were laughable. We were useless. We couldn't play at all so we had to do something stupid and experimental. Sid was a genius, but I wouldn't want to go back to playing Interstellar Overdrive for hours and hours. Unconstrained by conventional pop formats, Pink Floyd were innovators of progressive rock during the 1970s and ambient music during the 1980s. Critic Alan DiPerna praised Gilmore's guitar work as an integral element of Pink Floyd's sound. Rolling Stone ranked Gilmore number 14 in their 100 Greatest Guitarists of All Time list and DiPerna described him as the most important guitarist of the 1970s, calling him the missing link between Hendrix and Van Hollen. In 2006, Gilmore commented on his playing technique, fingers make a distinctive sound, aren't very fast, but I think I am instantly recognizable. The way I play melodies is connected to things like Hank Marvin and The Shadows. 
Gilmore's ability to use fewer notes than most to express himself without sacrificing strength or beauty drew a favorable comparison to jazz trumpeter Miles Davis. In 2006, Guitar World writer Jimmy Brown described Gilmore's guitar style as characterized by simple, huge-sounding riffs, gutsy, well-paced solos, and rich, ambient chordal textures. According to Brown, Gilmore's solos on Money, Time, and Comfortably Numb cut through the mix like a laser beam through fog. Brown described the time solo as a masterpiece of phrasing and motivic development. Gilmore paces himself throughout and builds upon his initial idea by leaping into the upper register with gut-wrenching one and one-half step over bends, soulful triplet arpeggios and a typically impeccable bar vibrato. Brown described Gilmore's sense of phrasing as intuitive, singling it out as perhaps his best asset as a lead guitarist. Gilmore explained how he achieved his signature tone, I usually use a fuzz box, a delay, and a bright EQ setting, singing sustain, you need to play loud at or near the feedback threshold. It's just so much more fun to play, when bent notes slice right through you like a razor blade. Throughout their career, Pink Floyd experimented with their sound. Their second single, See Emily Play premiered at the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, on May 12, 1967. During the performance, the group first used an early quadraphonic device called an azimuth CO ordinator. The device enabled the controller, usually right, to manipulate the band's amplified sound, combined with recorded tapes projecting the sounds 270 degrees around a venue, achieving a sonic swirling effect. In 1972, they purchased a custom-built PAW which featured an upgraded 4-channel, 360-degree system. Waters experimented with the M synthia and VCS3 synthesizers on Pink Floyd pieces such as On the Run, Welcome to the Machine, and In the Flesh. He used a Binson Echor C2 delay effect on his bass guitar track for one of these days. Pink Floyd used innovative sound effects and state-of-the-art audio recording technology during the recording of the final cut. Mason's contributions to the album were almost entirely limited to work with the experimental holophonic system, an audio processing technique used to simulate a three-dimensional effect. The system used a conventional stereo tape to produce an effect that seemed to move the sound around the listener's head when they were wearing headphones. The process enabled an engineer to simulate moving the sound to behind, above, or beside the listener's ears. Pink Floyd also composed several film scores, starting in 1968, with the committee. In 1969, they recorded the score for Barbet Schroeder's film Moore. The soundtrack proved beneficial, not only did it pay well but, along with a saucerful of secrets, the material they created became part of their live shows for some time thereafter. While composing the soundtrack for director Michelangelo Antonioni's film Zabrisky Point, the band stayed at a luxury hotel in Rome for almost a month. Waters claimed that, without Antonioni's constant changes to the music, they would have completed the work in less than a week. Eventually he used only three of their recordings. One of the pieces turned down by Antonioni, called The Violent Sequence, later became Us and Them, included on 1973's The Dark Side of the Moon. In 1971, the band again worked with Schroeder on the film La Vallée, for which they released a soundtrack album called Obscured by Clouds. They composed the material in about a week at the Château de Hirville near Paris, and upon its release, it became Pink Floyd's first album to break into the top 50 on the U.S. Billboard chart.
Gilmore's guitar work. Regarded as pioneers of live music performance and renowned for their lavish stage shows, Pink Floyd also set high standards in sound quality, making use of innovative sound effects and quadraphonic speaker systems. From their earliest days, they employed visual effects to accompany their psychedelic rock music while performing at venues such as the UFO Club in London. Their Slide and Light show was one of the first in British rock, and it helped them become popular among London's underground. Sonic Experimentation To celebrate the launch of the London Free School S magazine International Times in 1966, they performed in front of 2,000 people at the opening of the Roundhouse, attended by celebrities including Paul McCartney and Marianne Faithful. In mid-1966, road manager Peter Wynne Wilson joined their road crew, and updated the band's lighting rig with some innovative ideas including the use of polarizers, mirrors and stretched condoms. After their record deal with Emmy, Pink Floyd purchased a Ford Transit van, then considered extravagant band transportation. On April 29, 1967, they headlined an all-night event called the 14-hour Technicolor Dream at the Alexandra Palace, London. Pink Floyd arrived at the festival at around 3 o'clock in the morning after a long journey by van and ferry from the Netherlands taking the stage just as the sun was beginning to rise. In July 1969, precipitated by their space-related music and lyrics, they took part in the live BBC television coverage of the Apollo 11 moon landing performing an instrumental piece which they called Moonhead. Film Scores In November 1974, they employed for the first time the large circular screen that would become a staple of their live shows. In 1977, they employed the use of a large inflatable floating pig named Algae. Filled with helium and propane, Algae, while floating above the audience, would explode with a loud noise during the In the Flesh tour. The behavior of the audience during the tour as well as the large size of the venues, proved a strong influence on their concept album The Wall. The subsequent The Wall tour featured a 40 feet high wall built from cardboard bricks, constructed between the band and the audience. They projected animations onto the wall, while gaps allowed the audience to view various scenes from the story. They commissioned the creation of several giant inflatables to represent characters from the story. One striking feature of the tour was the performance of Comfortably Numb. While Waters sang his opening verse, in darkness, Gilmore waited for his cue on top of the wall. When it came, bright blue and white lights would suddenly reveal him. Gilmore stood on a flight case on casters an insecure setup supported from behind by a technician. A large hydraulic platform supported both Gilmore and the tech. Live Performances During the Division Bell Tour, an unknown person using the name Publius posted a message on an internet newsgroup inviting fans to solve a riddle supposedly concealed in the new album. White lights in front of the stage at the Pink Floyd concert in East Rutherford spelled out the words Enigma Publius. During a televised concert at Earl's Court on October 20, 1994, someone projected the word Enigma in large letters onto the backdrop of the stage. Mason later acknowledged that their record company had instigated the Publius Enigma mystery, rather than the band. Lyrical Themes Disillusionment, Absence and Non-Being Exploitation and Oppression Alienation, War and Insanity Recognition and Influence Members Discography
Marked by Waters' philosophical lyrics, Rolling Stone described Pink Floyd as purveyors of a distinctively dark vision. Author Jer O'Neill Serber wrote, Their interests are truth and illusion, life and death, time and space, causality and chance, compassion and indifference. Waters identified empathy as a central theme in the lyrics of Pink Floyd. Author George Reich described metal as psychedelic opus, echoes, as built around the core idea of genuine communication, sympathy and collaboration with others. Despite having been labeled the gloomiest man in rock, author Dina Weinstein described Waters as an existentialist, dismissing the unfavorable moniker as the result of misinterpretation by music critics. Waters' lyrics to Wish You Were Here as Have a Cigar deal with a perceived lack of sincerity on the part of music industry representatives. The song illustrates a dysfunctional dynamic between the band and a record label executive who congratulates the group on their current sales success, implying that they are on the same team while revealing that he erroneously believes Pink is the name of one of the band members. According to author David Detmer, the album's lyrics deal with the dehumanizing aspects of the world of commerce, a situation the artist must endure to reach their audience. Absence as a lyrical theme is common in the music of Pink Floyd. Examples include the absence of Barrett after 1968, and that of Waters' father, who died during the Second World War. Waters' lyrics also explored unrealized political goals and unsuccessful endeavors. Their film score, obscured by clouds, dealt with the loss of youthful exuberance that sometimes comes with aging. Longtime Pink Floyd album cover designer, Storm Thorgerson, described the lyrics of Wish You Were Here, the idea of presence withheld of the ways that people pretend to be present while their minds are really elsewhere, and the devices and motivations employed psychologically by people to suppress the full force of their presence, eventually boiled down to a single theme, absence, the absence of a person, the absence of a feeling. Waters commented, it's about none of us really being there, should have been called wish we were here. O'Neill Serber explored the lyrics of Pink Floyd and declared the issue of non-being a common theme in their music. Waters invoked non-being or non-existence in the wall, with the lyrics to comfortably numb, I caught a fleeting glimpse, out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look, but it was gone, I cannot put my finger on it now, the child is grown, the dream is gone. Barrett referred to non-being in his final contribution to the band's catalogue, Juke Band Blues, I'm most obliged to you for making it clear that I'm not here. Author Patrick Crosscarry described animals as a unique blend of the powerful sounds and suggestive themes of Dark Side with the Wall's portrayal of artistic alienation. He drew a parallel between the album's political themes and that of Orwell's Animal Farm. Animals begins with a thought experiment, which asks, if you didn't care what happened to me, and I didn't care for you, then develops a beast fable based on anthropomorphist characters using music to reflect the individual states of mind of each. The lyrics ultimately paint a picture of dystopia, the inevitable result of a world devoid of empathy and compassion answering the question posed in the opening lines. The album's characters include the dogs, representing fervent capitalists, the pigs, symbolizing political corruption, and the sheep, who represent the exploited. Cross Carey described the sheep as being in a state of delusion created by a misleading cultural identity, a false consciousness. The dog, in his tireless pursuit of self-interest and success, ends up depressed and alone with no one to trust, utterly lacking emotional satisfaction after a life of exploitation.
Waters used Mary Whitehouse as an example of a pig, being someone who in his estimation, used the power of the government to impose her values on society. At the album's conclusion, Waters returns to empathy with the lyrical statement, You know that I care what happens to you. And I know that you care for me too. However, he also acknowledges that the pigs are a continuing threat and reveals that he is a dog who requires shelter, suggesting the need for a balance between state, commerce, and community, versus an ongoing battle between them. O'Neill Serber compared the lyrics of Dark Side of the Moon's Brain Damage with Karl Marx's theory of self-alienation, There's someone in my head, but it's not me. The lyrics to Wish You Were Here's Welcome to the Machine suggest what Marx called the alienation of the thing, the song's protagonist preoccupied with material possessions to the point that he becomes estranged from himself and others. Allusions to the alienation of man's species being can be found in animals, the dog reduced to living instinctively as a non-human. The dogs become alienated from themselves to the extent that they justify their lack of integrity as a necessary and defensible position in a cutthroat world with no room for empathy or moral principle wrote Detmer. Alienation from others is a consistent theme in the lyrics of Pink Floyd, and it is a core element of the wall. War viewed as the most severe consequence of the manifestation of alienation from others, is also a core element of the wall, and a recurring theme in the band's music. Waters' father died in combat during the Second World War, and his lyrics often alluded to the cost of war, including those from Corporal Clegg, Free For, Us and Them when the Tigers broke free and the Fletcher Memorial Home from the Final Cut, an album dedicated to his late father and subtitled A Requiem for the Post-War Dream. The themes and composition of The Wall express Waters' upbringing in an English society depleted of men after the Second World War, a condition that negatively affected his personal relationships with women. Waters' lyrics to The Dark Side of the Moon dealt with the pressures of modern life and how those pressures can sometimes cause insanity. He viewed the album's explication of mental illness as illuminating a universal condition. However, Waters also wanted the album to communicate positivity, calling it an exhortation, to embrace the positive and reject the negative. Reich described the wall as less about the experience of madness than the habits, institutions, and social structures that create or cause madness. The wall's protagonist, Pink, is unable to deal with the circumstances of his life, and overcome by feelings of guilt, slowly closes himself off from the outside world inside a barrier of his own making. After he completes his estrangement from the world, Pink realizes that he is crazy, over the rainbow. He then considers the possibility that his condition may be his own fault, have I been guilty all this time? Realizing his greatest fear, Pink believes that he has let everyone down, his overbearing mother wisely choosing to smother him, the teachers rightly criticizing his poetic aspirations, and his wife justified in leaving him. He then stands trial for showing feelings of an almost human nature, further exacerbating his alienation of species being. As with the writings of philosopher Michel Foucault, Waters' lyrics suggest Pink's insanity is a product of modern life, the elements of which, custom, codependencies, and psychopathologies, contribute to his angst, according to Reich. Pink Floyd are one of the most commercially successful and influential rock bands of all time. They have sold more than 250 million records worldwide, including 75 million certified units in the United States, and 37.9 million albums sold in the U.S. since 1993. 
The Sunday Times Rich List, Music Millionaires 2013, ranked Waters at number 12 with an estimated fortune of £150 million, Gilmore at number 27 with £85 million and Mason at number 37 with £50 million. In 2004, MSNBC ranked Pink Floyd number 8 on their list of the 10 best rock bands ever. Rolling Stone ranked them number 51 on their list of the 100 greatest artists of all time. Q named Pink Floyd as the biggest band of all time. VH1 ranked them number 18 in the list of the 100 greatest artists of all time. Colin Larkin ranked Pink Floyd number 3 in his list of the top 50 artists of all time, a ranking based on the cumulative votes for each artist's albums included in his all-time top 1,000 albums. Pink Floyd have won several awards. In 1981 audio engineer James Guthrie won the Grammy Award for Best Engineered Non-Classical Album for The Wall and Roger Waters won the British Academy of Film and Television Arts Award for Best Original Song Written for a Film in 1983 for Another Brick in the Wall from the Wall Film. In 1995, Pink Floyd won the Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental Performance for Marooned. In 2008, King Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden presented Pink Floyd with the Polar Music Prize for their contribution to modern music, Waters and Mason attended the ceremony and accepted the award. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996, the UK Music Hall of Fame in 2005, and the Hit Parade Hall of Fame in 2010. The music of Pink Floyd influenced numerous artists, David Bowie called Barrett a significant inspiration, and The Edge of U2 bought his first delay pedal after hearing the opening guitar chords to Dogs from Animals. Other bands and artists who cite them as an influence include Queen, Tool, Radiohead, Stephen Wilson, Kraftwerk, Merrill Lyon, Queen's Rick, Nine Inch Nails, The Orb, and The Smashing Pumpkins. Pink Floyd were an influence on the neo-progressive rock sub-genre which emerged in the 1980s. Pink Floyd were also admirers of the Monty Python comedy group. They helped to finance their 1975 film Monty Python and the Holy Grail. In 2016, a major retrospective of the band's work was announced to take place at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London the following year to mark the 50th anniversary of their first single. The audio-visual exhibition, titled Their Mortal Remains, featuring analysis of the album cover art, conceptual props from the stage shows and photographs from Nick Mason's personal archive, opened in May 2017. Due to its popularity, it was extended for two weeks beyond its original closing date of October 1. Studio Albums Tours Notes Sources Documentaries <laughs>